So in this chapter, Rachel is uh, investigating or is wondering what is morality. He wants to uh, give a minimum conception of morality. Now to be clear, he's not trying to define, uh, you know, or trying to give you the moral theory right at the beginning and then, you know, kind of leave everything else at that. No, he wants to ask the question of what would be kind of like the bare minimum that's required for a moral theory. Now, um, you know, if you're taking notes, and you should be taking notes, immediately you ought to go to your notes and write down for the purpose um, Rachel's is trying to provide a minimum conception of morality. And you should especially go to your terms and write down minimum conception of morality. And if you've been skimming up to this point, you would already know what that is. And so you, you should write, down, write that down too. Now Rachel's doesn't give us a definition of it right off the bat. However, he does give kind of a a working definition of morality. Now, needless to say, this definition is a little vague. In fact, you might think that this definition is so vague that it's really pointless to ask the question about morality, ask anything about uh, what morality is. Well, guess what? Uh, you already have a moral theory. Uh, in fact, uh, I, well, I mean, I know this because you have goals. You have values. There are things that you're working for. So you already have a conception of morality. The question is, how well have you thought it through? Well, to illustrate what Rachel thinks is this minimum conception of morality, he uses uh, several cases. Now, uh, I am absolutely certain that you are not going to agree with all the conclusions that Rachel's reaches, and that's fine. I'm not in the business of trying to tell you what to believe. However, if you're going to reject one of the conclusions, you have to show where the error in reasoning is. You have to provide an argument. And we'll see what that involves as we proceed through the semester. So the first case that Rachel looks at is this baby Teresa case. Now, I'm not uh, going to recount the case here. Uh, you know, you can, you can read the case. It's very uh, clearly explained. Um, but he's going to kind of compare and contrast arguments for and against uh, transplanting all of Teresa's organs for other children. Well, uh, Rachel's provides an argument uh, with the conclusion that we should uh, transplant Teresa's organs for other children. The argument has, it's pretty simple, it's uh, two premises and one conclusion. Now a premise is a reason or a piece of evidence, a belief or an idea that is going to be used to justify the conclusion. And the conclusion is what is inferred from the premises. Okay? Um, I, I have uh, provided this argument in numbered premise form. And the reason why I did that, or numbered proposition form, the reason why I did that is for ease of reference. So the first premise is uh, pretty straightforward. Uh, in fact, to you know to disagree with this premise is at best confusing. Uh, at least on its surface, uh, you know, we tend to use this premise all the time. Now we might question it later on through the course of the semester, but you know for the moment it seems pretty straightforward. Now the second premise is probably more contentious. <laughs> um, you know it's it's not contentious that the other children will benefit from Teresa's organs. That, that doesn't seem to be a very open question. But the second part of this premise is very much uh, open uh, for contention, or at least the, uh, the uh, um, thing that uh, 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 Rachel thinks people will argue against. And then finally we have the conclusion that we should um, uh, transplant Teresa's organs. Now as I said, this argument is given in a numbered proposition form and is also a deductively valid argument. And deductively valid means that if the premises are true, then the conclusion must be true. Now, what this means is, is that you have the conclusion, and I'm betting, you know, at least half of you <laughs> disagree with the conclusion. Uh, you disagree with the conclusion, that's fine. Like I said, I'm not here to tell you what to believe. Now, since it's deductively valid, you have to show which of these premises is false? You have to show which of these premises is false. Okay. So it's in deductively valid form, and I wanna, uh, want you to look real quickly at the, um, 
parenthetical notation at the end of the conclusion. Now the parenthetical notation will tell you from which premises that conclusion is from, so in this case pre uh, premises 1 and 2, and it will also tell you uh, which inference rule is used. And in this case uh, the MP stands for modus ponens. Now modus ponens is probably the most widespread used argument in history ever. <laughs> you've used it yourself, although you've never called it modus ponens, I, I, I bet. Uh, no, modus ponens is really simple. Modus ponens has a conditional, and a conditional is a proposition, if we're using P and Q to represent propositions, a uh, conditional is if P, then Q. So if Rex is a dog, then Rex is a mammal. And the first part of the conditional is sufficient for the second meaning that if the first part is true, that the uh, second part must be true. The first part's called the antecedent, and the second part's called the consequent. So in this case, uh, you know, we have you know, the conditional if P then Q, we have the assertion of the antecedent, so we have the conclusion of transplanting Teresa's organs. Now like I said, I bet about at least half of you are going to disagree with Rachel's conclusion that we can uh, simply just transplant uh, Teresa's organs. And to do this, you have to reject one of the premises that are, that are used to infer the conclusion. And the first premise, like I said, is pretty, pretty solid. I mean, to, to doubt that, uh, you, know, you know, if an action benefits somebody without hurting anybody else, then we ought to perform that action. What that means is, since it's a condition, you have to say uh, an action would benefit somebody else, uh, would benefit people, not hurt anybody else, and yet we shouldn't do it. That seems strange. That seems strange. So the first premise probably isn't the one you're going to go after. It's going to probably be the second one. And usually the way that most people try to disagree with Rachel, and you anticipate this, and you know, wisely so, uh, is to say that, well, death, you know, so, you know, somebody is harmed in, in, this trans, in, in transplanted Teresa's organs, namely Teresa, because she's going to die. Right? So she's going to die. So uh, the rejection of the second premise usually is something like, well, Teresa, in fact, will be harmed because she will die. Now, Rachel um, thinks this isn't necessarily the case, and he, he just wants you to consider this. Uh, he wonders, so he asks the question, what does it mean uh, to benefit from life? So what all that Teresa could do is, well, nothing, right? She, her heart beats and her lungs breathe. Blood flows through her body, but she really doesn't have a brain to have anything like thoughts, beliefs, uh, uh, feelings. She can't relate to other people. Rachel's once once uh, suggests that uh, Teresa, in fact, cannot benefit from life. And what he also does, he's not explicit about this, but what he also does is he suggests that if uh, something can't benefit from life, then it can't be harmed. Then it can't be harmed. So the, so the idea is basically this, like, well, Teresa um, can't be harmed. Why? Because she, she has no benefits. There's nothing that is going to be good about her living. So uh, the way Rachel counters here is to say, yeah, you, know, you, you suggest that Teresa can't be harmed, but with this definition of, of benefit and saying that what really benefits life is having thoughts and beliefs and relationships with other people, uh, you know, the burden is, is for you to say, well, Rachel, you're missing something such that there is a benefit of life that Teresa has that she would lose if, if transplanting the organs. Um, but that's kind of hard to put together. Well, the next worry uh, that Rachel's is going to look at is using people. Right? So somebody objecting to the conclusion that uh, Teresa's organs should be transplanted would uh, suggest, say something like this, and say, well, look, if we're uh, removing Teresa's organs, then we're using one person for the sake of another. And this, you know, and, and that's wrong, right? And this idea is really prevalent in our culture. We uh, really don't like the idea of using anybody else, or we especially don't like the idea of anybody using us. So uh, we have lots of laws that try to prevent using other people. Uh, and we generally uh, tend to uh, stay away from or express disgust for people who are obviously users. Even being called a user is, is, is an insult. So this idea is appealing in our culture. Now, what something Rachel suggests is that we, in fact, are not 
using uh, baby Teresa at all. So we want to be really careful here in understanding what Rachel is trying to say. Rachel is not suggesting that it's okay to use people. No, Rachel agrees that it's not, it's not a, a moral thing to use other people. Now what he's suggesting is, is that uh, uh, Teresa would not be used at all. So the way that Rachel goes about doing this is he uh, tries to understand what it means to use somebody else. Now in most of the cases we talk about using other people, we talk about cases of manipulation. We talk about uh, cases of um, people performing an act to meet our ends and our goals and our needs. And specifically though, those times that uh, the people that we're using do not benefit from it. So, um, you know, if somebody had a gambling addiction, right, and you know, know they have a gambling addiction, uh, yet you uh, play cards with them anyway, knowing how to win or how to beat them in cards, right, that would be using somebody to line your pocket. So, what Rachel points to here is that uh, the idea of using another person is closely tied uh, to the idea that that other person has autonomy. And autonomy is the ability to make decisions for yourself, to uh, take those courses of actions that fulfill your desires and values, right? and, or to do what you want to do. It's kind of the simplest way of saying that. So Rachel's constructs an argument. So what he you know, this first premise, he says, you know, if one person uses another, then uh, that means that the, the second person, the person being used, has autonomy. Has autonomy. And the idea is, is that if somebody doesn't have autonomy, you can't use them. Right? And you take a look at these plants out here. These plants don't have autonomy. They don't have free will. They don't make decisions. Right? So there's no way that I can really you know, use the plants in a way that violates their autonomy. It's not in the way that I use persons. I might use the plants for food, but that's part of the function of a plant. Right? Uh, I can. I am not myself prone to do this, but if somebody wanted to get a tan, they could lay out in the sun, and so they could, you know, benefit from the sun's rays. But that doesn't use the sun because the sun doesn't have autonomy. So if you're using a person, right, then that person has autonomy. Well, the second premise is that uh, Teresa doesn't have any autonomy. Uh, her brain, she, simply because she lacks the hardware, uh, she can't have free will because she doesn't have enough of her brain to do that. In fact, um, in the case say she died in nine days, something like this. So she never, she not only did she not have the time to develop autonomy, but uh, she, in the way that her brain was formed, is that she could not develop autonomy. So the idea is that Rachel is suggesting is that um, uh, Teresa never had nor could have autonomy. Well, the conclusion that follows then that you uh, that Teresa simply can't be used. Now this is kind of an extreme conclusion, mostly because it doesn't really matter what you're doing with Teresa, she can't be used. And you might wonder about that. Um, you might take a, a look at it because some really scary scenarios start coming to mind rather quickly. So, Teresa. So here's Rachel's. Uh, Rachel's claim is that Teresa can't be used because she doesn't have autonomy. And again, take a look at the argument, look at the parenthetical notation. This comes from the first and second premise. Now this time, uh, uh, we're using an inference rule called modus tollens. Modus tollens. And modus tollens is uh, a little different than modus ponens. Modus ponens is if P then Q, given P, we conclude Q. Modus tollens kind of goes the other way. Say, if P then Q, we know not Q, Therefore, we know not P. Right? And uh, an example of this is something like uh, if an animal is a dog, then the animal is warm-blooded. Uh, Jaws the shark <laughs> is not warm-blooded. Therefore, Jaws is not a dog. Uh, so this is an argument uh, that Rachel provides about autonomy. And his point is, is that, Ray, that uh, uh, baby Teresa does not have autonomy, so she can't be used. You know, the last things that Rachel considers is uh, just the you know the pretty straightforward 
um, prohibition against killing in general. Um, you know, we generally say that it, you know, it's just wrong to kill. Now, usually when we say things like that, we're just thinking about ordinary circumstances, like, you know, you can't walk down the street and just kill somebody. Um, but Rachel is quick to point out that Teresa's case is not a usual case. Uh, you know, he, he says that there have already been, um, you know, everyday uh, uh, exceptions to the prohibition against killing. And, you know, unless you're some variety of a pacifist, you think so too. Right? Uh, pro you know, right now, probably, you know, if, if somebody were threatening your life and you had the means to end this threat, uh, by ending the threat's life, you would probably do so, either for yourself or for a loved one. So the idea is, is that you know, it's wrong to kill, you know, except in cases of self-defense, either for yourself or for a loved one. Um, we, you know, a lot of people argue, not everybody, right, but a lot of people argue that killing during time of war is uh, permissible. It's not necessarily desirable, uh, but it is permissible. You know, not any kind of killing, obviously, but at least some kinds of killing are permissible. Uh, if you think that capital punishment is something that a state can do, uh, then you think that there are exceptions to killing. So immediately, Rachel suggests that, well, um, we already have exceptions to uh, killing people. So just in and itself, that, that isn't going to fly. Um, so the question is whether or not killing Teresa by removing her organs is going to be permissible. So uh, one of the things that he, that he suggests is say, look, you know, our conceptions of what it means to die have changed through time. Um, right now, it's you know a person uh, can, in a sense, clinically die, meaning that their heart stops beating. Um, but be resuscitated, that their brain keeps on living, and so that they can be, in a sense, brought back to life. Um, used to be, death was considered to happen when the heart stops. We don't necessarily consider that anymore. These days, in fact, you know, we'll keep the heart beating in order to keep the brain alive. So the idea is that you know, real death, quote unquote, real death, doesn't occur until the brain dies. Well, in Teresa's case, she doesn't really have a brain. Uh, she, her brain was never really alive to begin with. So what Rachel wants to say is that uh, killing, the, the prohibition against killing, really doesn't apply in Teresa's case since she really isn't alive to begin with. Now Rachel considers two of the cases. And remember when he's Looking at these cases, what he's trying to do is to lay down some ground rules for what it means to have this minimum conception of a moral theory. What I want you to do is to read the cases and to try to reconstruct the arguments. Pay special attention uh, to the terms that are being used. Make sure you identify those terms. That's going to be really important uh, in understanding this whole process of reasoning. Uh, and what we're going to look at next, we're going to look at uh, what Rachel considers to be this minimum conception of morality. So now we come to Rachel's minimum conception of morality. Now again, this isn't, he isn't trying to provide the end-all be-all moral theory, more like uh, what conditions need to be in place in order to have a good moral theory. And the two that he proposes is good moral reasoning and impartiality. So immediately you got to go to your notes and write down good moral reasoning and impartiality, trying to figure out what Rachel means by these. So looking at good moral reasoning first, uh, Rachel tries to contrast uh, good moral reasoning versus what it is not. And the first thing he suggests is that good moral reasoning is not merely feeling or you know, even sometimes suggests that it ought not to be influenced by feelings at all. And there's a lot to what he says. Uh, feelings are not a guarantee of truth. Uh, we feel many things and um, based upon that we want to act on those feelings but that doesn't mean our feelings are always justified. So for instance, one of the biggest examples is hatred. Hatred is a huge motivator for all of us. We hate people every day. And sometimes that hatred uh, motivates us to do, you know, anywhere from mean and annoying, annoying things to downright uh, violent 
that doesn't mean that our actions are justified by those feelings. Right? It's, it's, it's hatred. It's not a moral principle. So hatred isn't really going to do it. Uh, and by the way, since feelings aren't necessarily good moral reasons for action, and hatred is a feeling, well, it also follows that love isn't necessarily a good reason for moral action. So that's a little bit scary, isn't it? The other thing that Rachel contrasts uh, good moral reasoning to are uh, wants, desires, tastes, or preferences. You know, just simple things that we just want. And, uh, you know, this, this doesn't always justify moral action. Um, for instance, I love espresso. Espresso, to me, is the reason why I get up in the morning. Uh, espresso, uh, I politely and accurately call it the black blood of life. So, uh, I love, I like espresso. That doesn't mean that I, or anybody else for that matter, are obligated to drink espresso. Um, there's quite a few people out there who I think would agree with me simply after the first time they try espresso. Uh, it, you know, you, you think so too, right? You have lots of tastes and preferences and you try to justify these actions by just the things that, that you like. And I'm not saying that you can't do those things that you like. I'm just saying they're not necessarily good reasons. Um, you know, for instance, suppose I had the weird preference to randomly assign uh, readings in the history of pencils in this course. Don't worry, I'm not going to do that. In fact, I have no interest in the history of pencils. But, suppose I did. Um, it would still not be a morally justified act to give you assignments in the history of pencils. So, simply a taste or a preference is not necessarily a good moral reason. And, by the way, you know, as I said before, feelings are simply a, a good moral reason. That's not to say they're completely irrelevant, but, they, you know, they're certainly not the determining factor, and they may not even be the top factor, depending on what your moral theory is. Well, at this point, you might wonder, well, what does count as a good moral reason? That's a great question. If you can answer that question, uh, you can write your own textbook in an Introduction to Ethics course. Actually, it would be the definitive textbook in the Introduction to Ethics course. Now, what counts as a good reason is difficult to say. Uh, however, we already think that there are some good reasons, and, and you do too. Right? We have values and principles that we consider to be good ones. Uh, liberty, equality, justice. If something threatens those, then we tend to think that there's something wrong happening, and we certainly have an option to defend ourselves in those cases. So yeah, we already have good moral principles, or you know, moral principles that we think are good. It's an interesting question as to what justify those. Okay, that's an interesting question. And hopefully through the course of the semester we can look at reasons to justify principles like that. Uh, there is one thing, however, there's an additional thing, however, that uh, is required of good moral reasoning, and that's logical consistency. Right? Now, logical consistency just means that your theory uh, produces uh, true conclusions, well, not even so much true conclusions, as uh, conclusions or actions that are not absurd or not self-contradictory, or they don't generate contradictions. You might wonder why this is so important. It's like, well, if you're theory generates contradictions, then it's going to say such things as, you know, an act is both moral and immoral, right? So, suppose my moral theory says that it's uh, moral to kill somebody in self-defense, and it's not moral to kill somebody in self-defense. Well, it doesn't provide a, a guide for action. It doesn't do what it's supposed to do. So, logical consistency is going to be another big thing uh, with moral theories. Now, here's just, you know, kind of a forewarning, you know, it's a common practice in ethics and in, in ethical reasoning to find counterexamples to moral reasoning. And the idea is, is that uh, you know, a moral principle, whether the person realizes or not, is going to infer that some course of action is, uh, is a, 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 a moral when in fact it's not moral. Right? Uh, so if my moral theory says that it's permissible to um, randomly kill every sixth person on the street, well then yeah, there's something wrong with that theory, right? How to reject that theory. Um, 
it's really, really hard. It's a statistical impossibility for your theory to be perfectly consistent. There's always going to be some problem that comes up against. There's always going to be some issue that it's going to come up against. And, uh, you know, it could be anything from uh, conclusions that are really difficult to accept, we just don't want to accept them, to direct contradictions, to absurdities, right? So, through the course of this semester, your <laughs> convictions are going to come up against these problems. I, I, I just, I promise you. Now, I am not here to tell you whether you're a good person or a bad person. This is, of course, an ethical theory, not a course in who's good and bad. I'm not interested in that project to begin with, and no ethical theory course can do that. Right? So, if it happens that your theory, your favorite theory, uh, moral beliefs, comes up against these problems, learn to handle them with grace. Right? Accept that, that it's a problem and try to move on from there or try to figure out a solution to it. Right? Uh, the really ineffective way of dealing with that is yelling <laughs> and anger. That just doesn't help. First of all, it doesn't help figure out where there might be a problem. Right? Uh, so, good moral reasoning, you know, what exactly counts is a really interesting question. But one thing that we're really certain is, is true is that uh, logical consistency is going to be a big requirement for good moral reasoning. So one condition for this minimum conception of morality is good moral reasoning. And the other condition is uh, impartiality. Now what impartiality basically means is that everybody's interests are considered equally. And you know, here we have the definition. Now, stating this definition and providing a definition is one thing. Applying it as another. Because just as a matter of fact, people's interests are going to conflict. People's interests are going to conflict. It's kind of the hallmark of what a society is. You know, the, per the perfectly harmonious society is one in which everybody has the same interests. But that just doesn't happen. People have different sets of interests. So interests are going to conflict. And since they conflict, you know, at most, one person's interests uh, are going to win out, or you know, one group of interests are going to win out, and it's possible that none of them do. Right? And trying to provide a solution, quite often I've seen this to be the case, and trying to provide a solution, you know, the solution is nobody gets what they want. All right? uh, a friend of mine used to say this uh, when he's talking about going to a meeting, uh, and uh, here was this definition of compromise. Uh, here's one good idea, and here's another good idea. What's a compromise? Let's do neither of them. Um, so interests are going to conflict, and somebody is going to win out, and somebody is not. Um, and trying to figure out who is going to win out, it's a very, very hard question. I mean, those solutions that can, you know, such that everybody can win are great, but they're really, really rare. Really rare. So as an exercise to really kind of drive this point home, I want you to write down your interests. Do you even know what they are? I mean, think about what your interests are. Write them down. And to further drive the point home, write down other people's interests that conflict with yours. What do you want? What's going to make your life better? And what do other people want? What's going to make their life better? Right? These are going to be conflicting interests. And a really difficult question is who's going to win out? Why should they win out? So we have Rachel's minimum conception of justice. And that is minimum conception. Minimum conception requires good moral reasoning, which includes logical consistency, and impartiality, which is treating everybody's interests equally, or considering everybody's interests equally. Now, an interesting question is whether Rachel's cases actually meet this minimum conception. Uh, remember what I said, it's Kind of a statistical impossibility that any given moral theory is going to be without any problems. Uh, if, if that were the case, if no moral theory had any problems whatsoever, or excuse me, if there was some moral theory that had no problems, well that would probably be the theory that we would teach in the course, instead of a whole lot of possibilities. Um, so you might ask yourself, you know, regarding the cases that Rachel provides, um, how might those cases run into problems? Do they run into problems? 
And here's my hint, yes, they do. <laughs> they already run into issues um, that people have with regard to some moral judgments about the life and death of a human being. All right, so I want you to think about that. Think about these cases where we talk about life and death of a human being. And think about how that might run into problems. Um, you might, again, also consider how logical consistency and impartiality bumps heads with your own moral theory. Uh, this is just good practice to start thinking about this. It helps you become a better person. So think about these issues, and we'll start discussing these in class.